Welcome back to Captains of Industry. We're still with me in studio, Derek Wilcox, CEO, Dimension Data, Middle East and Africa. Let's focus on balance now. Earlier you said you, you'd mm -hmm. like to start your day in a perfect world at yeah. 8 o'clock. You do give in to those 6.30 meetings when they arise. Uh -huh. What is balance in your book? Can you have it? We divided on this in the Captains of Industry environment. I'm very fortunate that I think I can have balance. And I think it's one of the great things about working for Dimension Data. Dimension Data is actually quite a family-oriented place. Um, we have many events where families come along, everybody knows each other's families, and we sort of encourage that uh, as a culture. And although we work very hard, we also encourage people to take leave um, and to spend time with their families over uh, the end of year holidays and you know also uh, during the year where you have midterm breaks and that sort of thing you'll find that our data does slow down a little bit um, and that's one of the things I enjoy about dimension data so though, though you may have the odd 18 hour day and there is a bit of travel involved in my in my job um, how I also much travel because that's <laughs> difficult to to balance the yeah. the travel and family I think I'm still feeling it out. I'm still quite new in the job, and uh, I think it's something that will settle down over time. I'm fortunate to be coming into my job at a time when uh, the combination of an economic slowdown and the need to cut costs and new technology and video conferencing is making video conferences much, much easier than they ever were in the past. So to give you an idea, in my first two weeks, I spoke to people from all 21 countries via video. Um, and that was the first time that somebody from Didata had ever done that so broadly. Um, to the staff. So we had a very open session, hi, and you know, you can ask me questions. It was an interesting experience and I got some very, very positive feedback on that. Are other companies embracing the video technology given, as you say, mm -hmm. the cost constraints potentially that they're facing right now? It is one of the fastest growing uh, areas in enterprise IT today, but I think it's still relatively small. There are very few companies that embrace it for anything but sort of executive communication. And I think it has so much more potential as a way to actually communicate more broadly with staff, to enable collaborative working groups across geographies. And it's something that I think pays for itself very, very quickly. Um, so it's something that we still encouraging our clients to look at far more strongly. You made mention of the fact that you're integrating more women across your teams. Yeah. How would you define the culture at Dimension Data at this point in time? It's a, it's a high performance culture and I think that we make no excuses for that. So we put a lot of effort into that. Um, and uh, I think that over the years though, we've evolved what that means. So we've just won again as one of the best employers um, in our size category, one of the top 10 employers in our size category in the South African market. Something we're very proud of and it's also similar to awards we won elsewhere in the world. Australia, Europe, the United States are all territories we operate where we win best employer awards. So we put a lot of emphasis on creating opportunities for people to actually advance and develop themselves. And one of those is our investment in our online learning facility through our Dimension Data University. So Dimension Data is a company that wants you to perform, but also gives you the opportunities to empower yourself with the tools that you need to perform. We don't spoon feed people, so the onus is on you to go to the Dimension Data University and make the most of what we actually offer. And we think that's very important. We're very strong on things like performance management. So we have a six monthly performance management cycle and we have a very formal global performance management system and everybody gets rated and it also affects the way you remunerate. What won't you tolerate in an employee? The only thing that really has ever made me angry, it's very difficult to get me angry, but the only thing that's made me angry in my 17 years with Dimension Data is that I've, if I felt somebody wasn't taking a client issue seriously. Um, so client is king in your The book. client is king. And you know, as long as you get that right, um, I'll tolerate a lot of other things. You know, I think that we, as a business, are quite tolerant of diversity and of different approaches, um, but we do share a common focus on delivering for our clients. It does become harder as you expand rapidly um, and as you grow around the world, and it's certainly something that we put a lot of emphasis on, on reinforcing. In your four months at the helm, what has been the biggest challenge to, to date? The biggest challenge for me is just going back to a head office job, if I can call it that, because we have very strong people running our various brands in this territory. Um, and those you don't battle to delegate then because of the, the strong no. teams? So they're very strong teams and uh, you know, they're largely autonomous um, and they run their own businesses. And a lot of my job is to say, well, what are those synergies between the various brands that we have? And then also what are the more medium to long term things that we can look at in terms of positioning our company? And I think the greatest challenge when you're in any head office job like that is to learn to be patient and to learn to actually exercise influence. 
surprises many people I talk to, but you actually have a lot less power as you get higher up. You have to uh, really work a lot more through influence. Um, and you have to be a lot more diplomatic. What about the Japanese influence now with the NTT tie-up? Yeah. Has that had any impact on Dimension Data, the company? Um, I think it's so far the impact has been entirely positive. Um, so I personally really enjoy working with the Japanese. I've had the privilege of going across to Tokyo a couple of times and spending time Lengthy with them. Lengthy board meetings with translators <laughs> in tow. Actually, that's what you may think, and there is the odd translator. But most of the people we deal with are on the international side of, of NTT, and NTT is trying very hard to globalize. And in those meetings, they're actually at pains to emphasize the fact that the meeting should be held in English, that people involved in the international business must be able to speak English, and that they must have a global perspective and mindset. Many of the people that I deal with have spent time in Europe, in the United States, elsewhere in Asia, for instance, in China or in Hong Kong. So they're very interesting people with a very global mindset. Um, so no, it's not long lengthy board meetings. The <laughs> Dimension Data brand, is that here to stay or, could, or is there potential for NTT to rebrand mm -hmm. the entire group? I don't know what NTT's long term plans are, but for now um, they've actually paid for us to go and have a global brand refresh after the acquisition of Dimension Data. And I think it was a very symbolic move from the Japanese for us and for our people to say that your identity, your culture, remains very important. We're not here to take that away from you. In fact, we want to leverage that identity and culture to help us to globalize where maybe the Japanese culture has battled a little bit to do that. For a long time, Dimension Data was synonymous with the personalities that founded mm. the business. Yeah. Where are we with the, the founders in the Dimension mm. Data story now? Well, you can't talk about Dimension Data without talking about Jeremy Ward, and he remains our executive chairman. Um, and he's still very much involved in the business. So he's very active in the business. Involved um, in the day-to-day -day running? Involved in the day-to-day -day business. He's particularly involved from a client perspective. So he spends a lot of time uh, you know, going to client meetings. Um, I think you know Jeremy well, and you know he's a fantastic salesman. Um, and certainly Jeremy will never say no if we ask him to support us. When we visit a client, if we're doing a big deal, he's always there to help us. So it's something we really appreciate. The actual operational running of the business day to day, those with the Chief Executive Officer Brett Dawson. Um, and Brett's been phenomenally successful since Do he took you over. and Brett work closely together? Very closely. So Brett's my boss. Um, and we work very, very closely. What does that together. mean? How many do you meet regularly with Brett over and the discuss last strategy? Over the last couple of months, I've been meeting with Brett on average about once a week. Um, sometimes that's via a phone call or via a video conference, but uh, you know, more often than not, it's actually face to face. And exactly, we, we discuss both the MIA strategy and what we're doing here, as well as Dimension Data's global strategy in response to cloud, enterprise mobility, etc. You're present in 21 countries. Where do you want to be? What, we've got 54 countries uh, on the African continent, 54, 55. Yeah. There's a little bit of a debate around that. Yeah. But are you wanting to be present in every single territory, or is that not necessary, going back to the regional plays? I think we have the footprint that we want in Africa now. We could expand our footprint a little bit more in the Middle East. And there are one or two countries in Africa that are always uh, tantalizing for us that for various reasons we haven't managed to enter. Egypt is one of those countries. Um, but by and large, I think we've got the footprint we want in Africa. What we're focusing on now is getting bigger, getting our brand better known, and getting stronger in the countries we are. And the Middle East foray? In the Middle East, we're in uh, Saudi Arabia. We're in the United Arab Emirates, both in Abu Dhabi and in Dubai. And we've gone into some of the other Emirates um, in a very low-key way at this point in time. Um, there are, of course, many growth markets in the Middle East. So markets like Turkey are always going to present attractive opportunities for us to look at. And we'll certainly look at that. Will you be driving that growth? Yes. Does that mean that you're going to be traveling Middle East extensively yes, over the next couple of months? I am <laughs> um, going up to Dubai a little bit later this year. And I'll be spending some time with our team there talking about uh, you know, our plans in that region. But there's nothing concrete at this point in time. You've been, as we said at the beginning of the interview, with the, the group since 1995. Mm. That's a lengthy history. <laughs> is, this, is this where you're going to stay? I mean, obviously, you're at the top of the game right now. Oh. Do, you see, do you see yourself playing out your corporate career at Dimension Data? Well, I'm very happy at Dimension Data. I enjoy my job. I like the people I work with. I enjoy going to work every day. And I've been fortunate to continually change jobs within Dimension Data, which has created tremendous opportunities for learning and growth for myself. You know, I think provided that remains 
uh, a mutually rewarding relationship, both for Dimension Data and for myself, I see no reason to look elsewhere. Did you ever target this job? Did you think that you would be no. sitting in the corner office? <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, I've never really targeted a job in my life. Um, I try and make the best of the job that I have. Um, I think many people often, you know, when you're interviewing people, people say to me, well, I'm glad about this job, but I'd like to now start chatting about my next step. And I always find that quite surprising. You know, I think you've got to focus where you are. Make a name for yourself as somebody that whatever you're given, you can do the best um, and be good at it. And then the other opportunities will open up. For How you. much has it got to do with luck? You mentioned luck earlier in the discussion yeah. as well. You said luck. you've been lucky. Luck is always important. I don't think anyone can be successful without luck. Of course, you have to put yourself in a position that when luck presents opportunities to you, you're in a position to take them. And you know, I think that people, for various reasons early on in their careers, put themselves in positions where they can't take the opportunities that are presented to them. Sometimes that's because they've overcommitted themselves financially. Sometimes it's because they haven't developed the necessary skills or the necessary self-confidence to do it. Um, and often those are soft skills that they're looking, not just technical skills. And because of that, the opportunities come along and they just find they're not ready for them. So they pass those opportunities by and say, well, another one will come, and it doesn't. If you, would if you were able to distill some key advice mm. for other young leaders mm. out there wanting to get to the top as mm. you have, what would that advice be? The first thing is I think you really have to develop your soft skills. Um, many the, people, the soft skills? The way you relate to other people, your ability to network, your ability to actually help other people develop their careers, develop to be the best they can be, and your ability to judge people uh, both in selling situations as well as in recruiting or development situations. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing that people don't focus on. People go and Is get the relationship the aspect. Correct. I think people um, you know, that are ambitious often accumulate hard skills. They do MBAs, they do corporate finance courses, they go on you know, all sorts of training that helps them accumulate those hard skills. And very often I think the thing that really holds them back is their inability to develop those soft skills. And I think you should be doing that very early on in your career. Don't wait until you're 40 or 45 or whatever the case may be. You know, start when you're 22, 23. Develop those soft skills. Read the books about soft skills. Go on some soft skills courses as well. They're much book, more important. Is there any book that stands out in this space? There is, actually. A lot of people have asked me that recently, and I've got a long list. But if there's one just to start with, um, and unfortunately he died quite recently, but I would really recommend Stephen Covey's Principle-Centered Leadership. You know, I think that the values... And the seven habits of uh, highly correct. effective people. I think those seven habits are very important to everyone, but particularly for leaders. I think principle-centered leadership has many concepts that I still think back to today. One is the emotional bank account. You can make withdrawals as long as you make more deposits. I think that's a perfect place to leave this. Derek, thanks so much for your time. That's it for this week's edition of Captains of Industry. Until next time, from myself, Bronwyn Nielsen, it's goodbye.